Lighter Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. We're heading to WonderCon today after we film this. A little bit about that more later. Also joining us, John Roca. Hey gang, glad to be back on. I'm wearing my uh, Superman shirt in honor of some movie that came out this weekend. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. <laughs> and also joining us, Mark Ellis. So I'm doing stand-up at the Chuckle Bucket, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on stage. Hey, hey, yuck, yuck. <laughs> no, we were thinking of the best comedy club names. The best has got to be Chuckle Bucket. <laughs> um, all right, before we get into our regularly scheduled program, yeah, a few announcements. We are heading to WarnerCon. Want to say that we have our uh, Collider Heroes panel tomorrow night at 7.30. It's room 152. Also, the Collider meetup is at 9 o'clock at the Lux Hotel second floor bar. You don't need a WonderCon pass for that. So if you're just in the L.A. area, you live here, you're visiting, and you want to go to that, that's where we'll be at. Uh, Batman v Superman, obviously that came out today. A lot of you guys saw it last night. We put up our spoilers review. We had our non-spoilers review uh, earlier in the week, but our spoilers review is there now. So I know there's going to be a lot of intense comments on those. <laughs> uh, send all your angry comments to my Twitter account. It's uh, <laughs> at, at Mark Ellis Live. Wait, at Mark Ellis why would Live. That be your my Twitter, Twitter account. Sounds weird. At Mark Ellis Live. Um, yeah. Uh, and then we have another show debuting as well today. Uh, Mark, you want to tell us a little bit That's about right. that? That's right. You can catch all my tour dates at Think Hero. Um, <laughs> uh, we have the movie trivia schmodown, everybody. And finally, after weeks and weeks and weeks of anticipation, of buildup, of John Campia and Dan Merle talking trash to one another, it finally goes down today, 2 p.m. PST. That's five for you East Coasters. You're going to be able to check out the match on Collider Video's YouTube channel. We are so excited to bring this to you. It's going to be a weekly series, two behemoths in the world of movies going head-to-head -head in movie trivia. The first one, like we said, debuts 2 p.m. PST today on Collider Video. Merle versus Campia. Oof. All right, what's the first topic? All right, well, a little bit of sad news starting off the day. Comedian, actor, writer, and producer Gary Shandling, best known for its Gary Shandling show and the Larry Sanders show, died Thursday for as yet unknown reasons. A spokesman for the LAPD said that they received a 911 call from Shandling's home on Thursday, saying only that Shandling suffered from a medical emergency. He later died in an LA hospital. Some of his film credits include Iron Man 2, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, Dr. Doolittle, Zoolander, and Over the Head. He was 66 years old. Dennis, thought on the untimely passing of Gary Shandling? It's sad and also surprising. Um, we hadn't heard anything about him being in bad health at all. The, his friends said that every time they saw him, they seemed, he seemed fine. So it's pretty sad. I know a lot of people, the younger generation, know him from like Iron Man 2 and mm -hmm. Captain America Winter Soldier. But for us older folks, we know him <laughs> from The Tonight Show and The Larry Sanders Show, which influenced a lot of my favorite comedies like uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Office, Extras, and stuff like that. So, Mark, what do you think? Uh, this guy was a comics comic. I, had, I was lucky enough to have a few brushes with him. And he's one of those guys that when a bunch of comics are hanging out in the green room he's the guy that we're laughing at he's the guy making other people who consider themselves humorous of note crack up and that's the hardest thing to do in stand-up is make people like us laugh consistently he was amazing on the larry sanders show that was the show that even before curb your enthusiasm and i actually looking back think it did it better than curb your enthusiasm did is it took that you know we're kind of going to put this premise on its ear of a half hour serial and what that means as far as improvisation goes as far as looking at what Hollywood life can be like and having a laugh at it. it I'd never seen anything like that before and I was a kid so it was really influential shaping my sense of humor and if you guys want a little bit more insight into who Gary Shanley was as a comedian make sure you check out the, the great Seinfeld documentary called Comedian that he did around 2000. Oh, yeah. Gary Shanley isn't in it for much but when he's in it you get a sense of who he was hanging out with other comics in the green room and then also check out recently he did an episode of Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee 
and it's it's one of the funniest and one of the most insightful ones into the world of stand-up comedy. Gary Shandling will will very much be missed, and uh, I'm lucky that I had the pleasure of walking by him a couple times. <laughs> Roka, yeah, it's a it's well, this is one of the painful ones. You know, we've we've lost a lot of people recently, but this one really hurts because I think with the world that we have now, the last thing we need is people who can do comedy really well leaving it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I, I echo everything you said, Dennis, and everything you said, Mark, as well. I it's, I was such a big fan of his. I was I've always been a fan of stand up. So when you see people who do it really really well, you just revere them in a certain way because comedy is so incredibly difficult. And to consistently be well at it and then parlay that into a dramatic career as well as an actor is really rare for a comedian. And so yeah, and I really <laughs> enjoyed seeing him in the MCU um, yeah. because yeah. when he came on screen, like you said, Dennis, people just they might see him. They're like, oh, I don't who is this guy? Right. When we saw him, we knew the sense of humor behind that. So even though it necessarily wasn't conveyed in the movies because that wasn't the goal of his role, yeah. but you knew that it was right there. You yeah. can see it right there. That like that snarky wit that he had. You knew it was right there on the tip of his tongue, and yeah. and it added another layer of enjoyment for me in those movies. Yeah, and one, and one of the one of the underappreciated comedy gems that I saw one, it was What Planet Are You From? That still is one of the com mm -hmm. consistently funny films that he wrote, directed, got Annette Bening to be in all that jazz. It was it's a fantastic film and. The guy was a boxer on the side. A lot of people don't know I this. Did he, not know yeah, that. he trained for years as a boxer. He would have people over. You know, there are many interviews. I read many interviews with him in GQ, Esquire, Vanity Fair, whatever. And he would talk about that, that this was a consistent thing for him, you know, that he had that. And that's how he kept his timing. And it affected how he did his timing on stage or what did his timing in his comedy. So the man was multi layered, multifaceted, and all the best comedians really are. And he was great from beginning to end. If you saw a stand up, I mean, I remember seeing him on a new comedian show mm -hmm. like way back when in the 80s. And then to see him progress to hit the nadir in the Larry Sanders show that he did and have it influence so many things that came after, including Louis. I mean, you can put so many right. mm -hmm. sitcoms that have deal with real life in comfortable moments and an anti-hero that you follow anyway because you see the vulnerability behind his pathetic desire for attention. You know, I mean, he launched uh, Jeffrey Tambor pretty much. I mean, that, that guy hey had gone had gone mm -hmm. away and then on Larry Sanders. Show. So the man was just amazing for so many reasons and incredibly funny. He'd be missed. And then it was not <clears throat> uh, this was actually done before his passing. But HBO was planning on bringing back the Larry Sanders show. Just I mean, not a new version, right. but just the, the old episodes mm -hmm. that they had. So mm -hmm. it's a strange coincidence. Um, yeah. All right. What's next? Despite the less than stellar reviews by critics for Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, the stars and director Zack Snyder are not letting it get them down. <laughs> Superman himself, Henry Cavill, was the first to comment on the reviews, saying the critics don't really matter. It's the audience that will dictate its longevity and whether or not more films will be made because they're the ones that are buying the tickets. Other actors from the movie share the same sentiment, with Wonder Woman Gal Gadot saying she thinks Zack Snyder has done an impeccable job laying the groundwork for more characters in the future. Future. Snyder himself says he's always been a comic book guy and that he made the movie using that aesthetic as much as he could. He said, I don't know how else to do it 100%, so it is what it is. So far, ticket sales have not been affected by the negative reviews, with the film forecast to make $300, $300 million in global <laughs> ticket sales this <laughs> opening weekend. Mark, what do you think of the cast and Zack Snyder's comments against the negative reviews? It's what I want to hear, Natasha. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I want my cast and my director to be defending the movie movie that they made they should not be like oh you know what after seeing how the critics feel about this we did not make that good of a movie like I want them being like hey we're waiting for the audience to decide because nobody ever goes out to make a movie to impress critics you do it for the fans of whatever genre whatever franchise whatever comic book series you're making so I like hearing these comments and done in a classy way I feel like as opposed to uh, you know the director of Gods of Egypt who's going to come out yeah. and just have this long Facebook tirade is why critics are evil I like what Henry Cavill said he's like you know what that's fine they you know everybody can have their opinion we make these movies for the fans we're gonna wait to see how the fans feel about the movie yeah. they are the ones that will determine the future of this franchise and i hate to bring up transformers because i feel like batman vs superman is a lot better movie than any of those transformers garbage piles but the fans <laughs> determine whether they make more transformers movies critics uh, critics do not like those movies but fans keep going to see it thus we keep getting more transformers movies batman vs superman it's going to be the same thing yeah. if the fans come and check it out and I hope they see it in theaters this weekend because I want to see more of these movies too. One of the things, despite my, despite the way that I, I didn't love Batman versus Superman, one of the glowing things I felt walking out of that movie is that I have so much hope for the future of the DCU and seeing Justice League. I'm pumped for that, man. So I hope everybody checks it out.
Broke up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a, I agree with you more. Absolutely. I think it, it, I think it's always good to see a director and a cast defend their film. Or else, why do they spend time making it? Mm -hmm. You know. And I agree that they are very. It's very classy responses. And the thing is, for me, I went and saw it. You, uh, my opinion is my opinion, but I like the fact that they're they've made a very bold choice with everything they've done. It's pretty ballsy. It's bold. bold. You may disagree with it a thousand percent, but it's still ballsy. And the fact that they're willing to stand behind it and they're willing to say, yeah, we do this for the fans. And there are many films that are critic proof nowadays because the fans decide what they want to go see. I mean, it's very relevant to what's going on in political culture as well. They're deciding who they want. The, the critics, the outside uh, uh, talking heads can say whatever they want, but people are going to choose what they want to see and who they want to see. And th I think a film like this, I, with what Mark said is absolutely right. Like, I want to see more films like this. I want to see them hit and miss. It is, I don't want this genre to die at all because I enjoy it so much. And it's a, it opens the door for so many new voices to come in and create product like this and create and have their shots at franchises, at films within the franchises. And that's always great to see. Yeah, I like the comments <laughs> as well, especially because they're much... <laughs> much nicer than mm. than what we had with Alex Proyas and mm -hmm. Gods of Egypt. I, I do believe, though, deep down that the, the, the director and the cast, they do care about critics reviews. Sure, I mean, sure. they, they, I mean, obviously, they want the fans to be happy, but the critic reviews matter at least for their own, you know, ego. ego. Probably, um, yeah. But it, the, the fans opinions matter as well. And I, I agree with you. It is kind of a, a Transformers type situation, though not this is not as Bad as Transformers. Nobody here is saying <laughs> no, that this no, movie's no. like Transformers. But, it, but it's critic proof that like yeah. the fans are gonna love it, go see it, it's gonna make lots of money and they're gonna make another one. Um yeah, I I like the movie, I didn't love it. I, I just don't like when people go super fanboy. Uh, you and me and so, a few other people like Dan Merle, Christian, and a few other people got attacked this morning from some some people just going crazy, you know? Oh, they're like, wow. ah, 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 you know, it's like <laughs> calm down. Look, yeah. maybe we didn't like the movie as much as you did. That's fine. If you loved it that's okay but just make sure that you try and debate it in a rational manner yeah. and like i think that's the you know one thing i even zack snyder probably doesn't want people running out going screw you guys you didn't love the movie i think he wants that a little bit maybe, okay, maybe. but uh, <laughs> yeah i mean like, but also like if you are going to criticize a movie if you're going to stand up there and say this is my opinion i didn't like it or i loved it you have to have thick skin and be able to take on if people want to criticize you yeah. so yeah. i welcome all that stuff you can tweet me your thoughts anytime <laughs> at john schnepp it's totally <laughs> fine with me <laughs> All right, what's next? There's a political showdown <laughs> happening in Georgia over a controversial new bill that would protect religious officials from having to perform same-sex marriage ceremonies while also allowing faith-based organizations to deny services of employment to those who violate their religious beliefs. With the bill now on the desk of Governor Nathan Deal, the Walt Disney Company and Marvel Studios released a statement saying, Disney and Marvel are inclusive companies, and although we have had great experiences filming in Georgia, we will plan to take our business elsewhere should any legislation allowing discriminatory practices be signed into state law. With big tax incentives, the state has become the go-to place for Hollywood productions, with Marvel and Disney utilizing the incentive as well as The Walking Dead. Governor Deal has yet to make any decision. John, what are your thoughts on the possibility of Marvel and Disney leaving Georgia? Well, something easy to answer, yeah. Uh, well, let me, let me just say just right off the bat, I think this is a very bold and powerful move by these two companies. But these bills have are starting to become uh, and starting to be introduced in these states and in these state senates to be passed or to be voted down. Um, and it all hinges on business. It seems to be businesses are stepping up, just like you see here with Disney, with Marvel, and Lionsgate, Time Warner, HBO, AMC, 20th, 20th Century Fox, Warner. they're all stepping out and saying that they don't want this bill to go forward because they do think it's discriminatory. Um, I was watching a couple of videos on this, and the CEO of the Atlanta Visitor and Convention Bureau said it could cost the state three to six billion dollars in revenue. And that's a lot, that's a huge chunk of revenue that you're losing as a state. Um, so this is, everything hinges on business. In Indiana, they turned it down. And then uh, I think it was the other, oh no, I mean, they, Indiana, they approved it. And then in another state, they, they, they oh, Arizona, they turned it down because the business is because of the pressures. And now you're hearing sports organizations stepping up. Uh, the SEC, the final, NCAA Final Four, the NFL with the Super Bowl are saying they're not going to look at Georgia if this passes. So here, my feeling is this you are a citizen of this country, you have a right to vote 
or not vote for a bill, pass or not pass a bill. But in the end, there are consequences both ways. And so Disney and Marvel removing themselves is their right as a business to not want to do business in a state that does things that they don't support. It's their right, just as it is your right not to vote for it or to vote for discriminatory practices. This is what makes this country so great. But the businesses have a right to pull themselves out. And I think that's where this whole entire thing is starting to hinge in every state. Yeah, I agree with you. I think I, I do actually think the governor is going to veto yeah. it because there's no way they can take that loss of money. And that's where where, where you're talking about uh, people vote, you know, the citizens vote, but the businesses, they can you they vote with money. Yeah. Right. And and the state's going to be like, that's a lot of money to lose because there's so much production film and television production happening in Atlanta, right. Georgia right now yeah. that I just don't see how they could like they could live with that like all that money leaving so i have a feeling it's not going to happen i don't think it's going to happen either i don't think it should happen this has gone from being a political issue to something that is basically a human rights thing that we're talking yeah. about here a discriminatory practice should not be allowed to go on anywhere in the united states so the fact that there's a company as big as disney marvel or like you said the nfl saying hey we're, we're going to take our our business elsewhere i think is a huge step towards that and i don't i'm not like i'm not going to attack the entire state of georgia or atlanta right for the fact that this bill is up for either approval or veto as long as it does get vetoed i mean then if it doesn't then you can start aiming all your vitriol towards them but until then let the governor make the correct decision yeah. and then hopefully these uh th these film companies can continue to film in georgia i mean if because if you didn't have as big of a name as disney or marvel right and it was just like somebody like rob reiner who also stepped up and said yeah, yeah i won't do it either that's great walking dead is great i love that show i love rob reiner's movies mm -hmm. that does not have the impact of a disney marvel right saying we're not going to be doing this here anymore because like you said the billions of dollars of revenue that they generate it would be the correct decision i've had nothing but great experiences in atlanta yeah the first comedy club I ever worked you want a bad comedy <laughs> club <man. laughs> uptown comedy corner ladies and gentlemen yeah. may it rest in peace so atlanta's a great town let's keep it that way well and i i served uh i've served two years in augusta georgia at fort gordon and so in the army so i had plenty of experiences in georgia that i enjoyed and had a great time there so this is just this is just happening right this is starting to be the pushback of religious liberty this versus discrimination this is all happening in our country now but like we've said pulling out the businesses pulling out this is the only thing they can that's the way they register their vote yeah and unfortunately the bill started out as just a pastor protection act but then the state senate got involved and they added these things and this is what's the crux of the problem is their additions to the original bill is why these businesses mm -hmm. are calling discriminatory and threatening to to pull themselves out of the state all right guys uh now on to our buy or sell segment natasha what do we got not wanting to be left out of the superhero conversation, 20th Century Fox and Empire Magazine have released new images for their latest mutant superhero movie, X-Men Apocalypse. The new images feature a look at Oscar Isaac's Apocalypse, while the other features Ben Hardy's mutant angel before he changes into one of the four horsemen of Archangel. We shall now have to wait and see what the rest of the movie looks like when X-Men Apocalypse comes to theaters this May 27th. Dennis, buy or sell the new images from X-Men. Uh, I buy them. I I really like that cover with Apocalypse walking through the fire and he's got his force hor horsemen behind him. I also really like the angel one because the, the wings on them look really mm -hmm. much more realistic mm -hmm. than those CG ones in The Last Stand when Ben Foster was angel. Oh, yeah. Those look terrible, <laughs> but these actually look pretty cool. And maybe what we didn't get in, in that one is uh, the transformation to Archangel and to see maybe how painful that process is going to be for for him. Um, what did you think, Roka? Yeah, I like the images. I, uh, the, they've done a really good job since that first trailer of giving you better stuff to look at, giving you better stuff to get excited about the movie for. And I thought this did a nice job of doing that as well. I like the. Uh, I agree with you about the angel and his wings, absolutely. And I don't mind seeing Archangel. When I initially saw Archangel in the trailer, I wasn't the biggest oh, fan. Okay. But seeing it in this picture, it looks a lot more of the because that's my favorite x-men mm -hmm. it was archangel when he became archangel and so um seeing that version of him i actually am even more excited to see you don't it. mind that they don't have the, his like typical mask yeah the blue thing. Yeah. yeah no no I, I think this is the way it works and logically it has to be that way i think because they want to keep 
the blue just on Apocalypse and no one else. So I'm sure the, uh, the actor's pretty happy about it, too. Yeah, He's right. like, oh, you can see my face. I know, yeah. Oh, uh, Mark, always important. You know, it's funny. That's the same picture that I kind of gravitated towards, even though we have a great cover. We have that great electric lemonade-looking thing down there in the corner. But we also have the – you're seeing not only somebody – the pain of becoming a mute and actually growing into what is going to be Archangel, but also it looks like there's frustration mentally as far yeah. as not being able to control your own fate anymore, which is probably what all these horsemen are going to be going through, the ones that are going to be going into battle on the side of Apocalypse. So this proves to me that May is going to be a kick-ass month for movies because we kick off with Civil War. Yeah. We're going to get the nice guys in there. I think Neighbors is in May, too. And then having this also be in May, it's going to be a stacked month. It's a great way to go out. All right, what's next? Warner Brothers has released the first trailer from Hangover director Todd Phillips' War Dogs starring Jonah Hill and Miles Teller. Based on a true story, War Dogs follows two friends living in Miami during the first Iraq war who exploit a little-known government initiative that allows small businesses to bid on U.S. military contracts. The film also stars Bradley Cooper and Anna de Armas and opens in theaters on August 19th. Mark, buy or sell the new trailer for War Dogs. It's a buy for me. I like how it's very serious political overtones, but there's also going to be some humor in this movie. I think Miles Teller and Jonah Hill were the right cast going forward. <laughs> it just seems Sorry, like there's guys. a war going on in Roka's chair right <laughs> it now. really is. Um, I apologize to everyone. I think, I think Riley stole the good chair <laughs> and left uh, Roka the bad chair. I yeah. think somebody heard Roka's review of BBCS and was like, ah, I'm taking a screw out. Screw this guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, and Miles Teller is a guy who I really think he's a great actor. I like him a lot on screen. I had a little beef with him yesterday on Jedi Council, but it's over. It's done with. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so him and Jonah Hill, and then you also throw Bradley Cooper in there. The cast is really shaping up to be something special, and the trailer impressed me. I'm in. Well, I'm going to buy this trailer, but before I talk about the trailer, I thought it was interesting they cast Miles Teller and Jonah Hill together because they have the same voice. I don't know if you have ever <laughs> closed your eyes, listened to the trailer. You're wow. not going to be able to tell who is talking in, wow. in this one. Oh, that's um, funny. I, I actually I thought the trailer was funny. I like that yeah. line. Uh, don't worry, I, I need to go first because I'm American. <laughs> that line was hilarious. And just that one line uh, where he's like going, uh, what was it? Uh, you guys drove through that, this? The death, the death triangle, triangle of right, death. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just thought it was funny. It looks like a hangover meets, um, whatchamacallit, uh, Wolf, Wolf of Wall, of Wall Street. Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's set in the Iraq War, so I'm all for this. Roka? Well, as the veteran of the services, <laughs> I have to sell this. Okay. I, I did not enjoy the trailer at all. I didn't like the comedy. I thought... It played to some of the worser characteristics of us as as Americans, and I I, th I thought Lords of War is a better film about gun running that happens out of control in all um, all military situations and in all wars that we get into. I, I get it, you know, you want to do the hangover, you want. I just think it's too serious of a subject matter to make this kind of a film about. There are plenty of very hilarious. Uh, military comedies that I've seen that I've enjoyed very much. So I'm not sticking the mud about that. It's just something about this type of humor that hit the wrong button for me, and I just didn't enjoy it uh, as I would have hoped to enjoy it. Can I ask you, is it is it the based on a true story aspect? Is it a too soon kind of feel? Or yeah, is it, it just the fact soon. that because, because something like Stripes, which is arguably the Great. funniest military comedy of all time, right. is so like out there and outlandish mm -hmm. that there's no way that could ever be in reality. Right. So you just kind of sit back and laugh at it. Is it because it's maybe too soon to the events or because it is based on a true story or both? Well, I feel it's too soon for me, for the events and all the stuff that's going on with the veterans, all the stuff that's going on with PTSD, all the stuff that's going on with the Wounded Warrior Project. Right. To me, it's just a little too soon to joke about about two people making a lot of money that, of people dying. If they had if they had a juxtaposition in the humor of serious moments of them seeing like the effects of what they're doing, so you could still have the comedy, but then see the reality of the comedy. So you have a more layered, nuanced film. I would have enjoyed well, that. Part of the reason why I bought the, this <clears throat> this Excuse trailer me. is because while we didn't get a lot of the the dramatic moments, I think that I don't mind using comedy as a vehicle to be, to get people into a theater and then actually making a point. Now this could yeah. just be a madcap comedy all the way through, right. but sometimes you go see a comedy and you laugh a lot but you also it gives you something to think about that's my goal with this movie yeah. which is why I bought the trailer because I think the trailer conveyed to me that they do have that opportunity to take advantage of that yeah and also I think at least I hope so yeah. that it's it's more of a darker comedy mm -hmm. in the sense of like I said that line don't worry I, you know I I should go first because I'm American I, I'm laughing at that that You're type right. of mentality right. not like 
with them. Right. So, all right. Uh, what's next? La Femme Nikita and the Fifth Element director Luke Besson has released a first image from his newest sci-fi movie, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Yesterday, Besson tweeted out a photo of his two leads, Dane DeHaan and Cara Delevingne, in costume, giving us our first look at what the movie might look like. Based on the graphic novel of the same name, the movie is about Valerian, played by DeHaan, and Loreline, played by Cara Delevingne, who are special operatives for the government of the human territories charged with maintaining order throughout the universe. The film also stars Clive Owen, John Goodman, Ethan Hawke, Rudger Hauer, and jazz legend Herbie Hancock. John, buy or sell the first image from Luke Besson's latest movie. Okay, uh, sadly, I'm going to have to sell this as well. Uh, it doesn't strike like uh, as as cool of a chord as I would like. Um, I'm a huge like Luc Besson fan, although some people could argue he hasn't done a good film since The Fifth Element. I, I like Lucy. I'm one of the few people standing on the side of liking Lucy. But something about this doesn't radiate enough interest for me. I, I, I This is an interesting choice for the two leads because they don't, they're not really typical leads and they've got, they've got actually some pitfalls in their own resumes. So I'm, I'm not 100% sold on this, so I would say sell. And it's got a little bit of a Jupiter Ascending vibe and that, <laughs> that worries me. Mark? Yeah, I hate selling a picture that is based on a production that I have no other context for. Right. But I have to sell this, too, because I'm, I want to see this movie. Like, the description Natasha read and all the cast in it, not just with the members we see, but also, like, Clive Owen, John Goodman's in this movie. Rutger Hauer? Come on, baby! <laughs> Rutger freaking Hauer! But I just, this picture doesn't move me at all, despite the fact that I'm a huge Dane DeHaan fan. I was just wondering last week, I was like, you know, we haven't seen him in a minute. Yeah. What's he been up to? Now we know what he's been up to, and I hope that this movie is great and showcases his incredible acting ability, because he definitely has it. He was great in The Place Beyond the Pines. He was great as the best roadie Metallica's ever had, so <laughs> I really look forward to this movie. I just have to sell this particular picture. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to sell it as well. There, there were other images that got released. There was one that we, we looked at before that kind of looked like a Cylon. Yeah, the soldier some sort of red Cylon and some other pictures and those are fine. This was the first picture. I'm selling it because like, I don't understand. At first, when I first saw it, I didn't realize that was Luke Besson. I was like, oh, that's <laughs> the third character in the movie. Mm -hmm. blah, blah. And I look closer. I was like, wait, that guy was wearing a jacket and there's a cartoon drawn on it. And then, and then Dane DeHaan and, and what's her name? Cara Car Car They're both being very serious and he's just there like, I, I don't know why he's there. Why would you put put that as your first picture out yeah. there. Imagine if Batman v Superman came out and the first picture that was tweeted of Batman was Zack Snyder just giving the double thumbs up <laughs> next to Batman who's like all serious. I, I don't know. <laughs> I did not like Lucy. I actually, at first, the first half of it I thought was pretty good yeah. and then for me it went off the rails. So yeah, for me, he hasn't done a good movie in a while and he sticks yeah. his name. He like writes and produces a lot of films that yeah. sometimes you associate him his name with but he actually didn't direct it. This one, he's actually directing. Yeah, and I like Cole in Chronicle, but then I didn't yeah. like it. Or is it Dan? I'm sorry. Dan, 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 yeah. Dan, I'm sorry. I liked him in Chronicle, but I didn't like him in this Spider-Man movie, which could have been the Spider-Man yeah. movie as a whole, but I didn't buy his yeah. hair. If I'm liking your James Franco version better than your Dane Don version, that's a problem for me. <laughs> and just, and I'm not, you know, and, and Kara, keep, everybody keeps saying she's the next superstar, next superstar, but none of her films really take off. Paper Towns sank and died at the box office. Mm -hmm. And so the these are the things that I worry about, and that's the only reason. It's not a criticism of their talent or their abilities at all. It's more saying, like, is this the right star power to get you into a film about sci-fi mm -hmm. based on a French guy? Like, there's so many things working against it. I think casting a star with a with an act with real acting talent and power would have been a, a smarter way to go. All right, guys. Now we're on to our <laughs> weekly segment we call Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we try to predict the top five movies. I wonder what number one is going to be um, <laughs> for the weekend. Mark, what's a, what's your top five? Well, it is uh, predicated upon how many of Natasha's family members go see my big fat Greek <laughs> wedding, too. I got a big family. I know. So. Uh, <laughs> it really is going to sway it for me. So Zootopia has just been killing it at the box office. So I'm going to say that Batman v Superman is going to be number one. I think that Zootopia remains at number two. I think my big fat Greek wedding will slide in under under that, but above Allegiance. So I'll put that at three. I'll put Allegiant at four, and then I'll toss Miracles from. You know what? If Hardcore Henry, it's not a wide release till next week, so I'll say Miracles from Heaven will be number five. Okay, my list is pretty similar to yours. Obviously, Batman v Superman number one, uh, Zootopia number two. That's been a powerhouse. 
three, my big fat Greek wedding. But number four, I'm going to switch it with you. I think that Miracles from Heaven is going to keep onto that four spot. I think that just the negative buzz about uh, what, Divergent, Allegiant, mm-hmm. whatever that film is called is just <laughs> I don't think there's going to be many like repeat uh, viewers and I don't think they're going to get any new ones so I think that's going to drop to number five Roka? Yeah I have Batman vs. Super- I have pretty much your, your list Mark of Batman vs. Superman 1, Zootopia 2, Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 although I'm worried about Big Fat Greek Wedding because the reviews are so bad mm-hmm. that it might push it below Allegiant but for now I'm going to keep it at 3, Allegiant at 4 uh, and Miracles from Heaven at 5 I think uh, a legion has a stronger base in terms of the young adult crowd that there's there once they get past batman versus superman they'll go and see a legion more than the christian crowd for miracles from heaven i just mm-hmm. think it's i think just think they're a little more of a powerful box office group at this point okay uh, so if we do a tiebreaker then i think that we need to predict the number that yes. batman versus superman oh, let's, let's hits. Do it. now okay i've been saying 200 million for like months yeah. right and uh i i hate doing this <laughs> but i have to use the most recent information at hand and i'm gonna temper those expectations just a little bit mm. my number is going to be 183 million dollars wow. opening weekend for batman v superman take it to the bank well, I'm going to prices right you and say 184 yeah, I can't million. Believe this just yes. happened. <laughs> um, yeah, I also had it over 200 and yeah. I'm going to temper it a little bit, but I think it's still going to make a decent chunk of change. I think you're both, I think it's going to go over 200 absolutely. Oh, uh, you should have 182. No, uh, 200 <laughs> million. It's going to go 200 million at least, okay. if not more. I mean, the fact that our opening thing Natasha uh, read was 300 million possible so i mean globally so to me 200 million is at least what it's going to do because man of steel made that much money the bat people are happy to see batman back again i wonder woman's getting good buzz i think people are going to come in droves to see it just to see if it's a train wreck or not yeah mm-hmm. so all right guys now on to mailbag before that i want to remind you that we're going to take your live twitter questions at the end of the show you can tweet us at collider video uh but let's get to the mailbag first natasha what do we got Ty Carnes writes, Hey Collider crew, I love the new ideas and trailer reactions you guys are doing. You're all settling into your new roles great. Do you think it's a mistake to set the DCU in such a, in such a dark universe? With Marvel, even if it's a subpar film, you can still walk away uplifted from seeing a colorful and fun mediocre movie. But with DC, their universe is set in this dark dreary world where every movie needs to be stellar to keep you from feeling exhausted or depressed. Civil War looks like it's more serious, but the DCU look dark personally i feel like their first and maybe biggest mistake was the tone they chose to take with their universe i worry that their world creation will be an uphill battle as long as they try to stick with this tone guys what are your thoughts i i personally don't think that it's a mistake to make it a darker tone and maybe a more realistic tone Uh, i think that differentiates them from marvel and i think for the dc universe it fits it well Uh, the issues i personally have with Batman v Superman have nothing to do with tone. I don't mind. I mean, The Dark Knight is my favorite comic book movie of all time, and that's really dark and depressing as well. Uh, I think it's it's just more of the execution of some of the plot and character things in the movie that I had a problem with. So I don't think making the universe dark is a mistake. Roka? Yeah, I don't think so either. I'm actually enjoying this because you have to offer a juxtaposition to Marvel because DC would have would have been raked through the coals just in the same way they're being now if they had done exactly what Marvel did because they'd be like, oh, they look at them, they're just imitating Marvel. It, they would not have stood out. So going the darker route and you have these stories within the main characters of the DC universe that you can explore the darkness a bit more. Parents dying, being the only survivor of a dead planet. I mean, there's so much that gets involved in that having to you know being kicked off your island there's so much that gets involved here with dc that going dark is okay and i still think there are moments of hope within the darkness it's not just all black it's not a you know what is what's that peanuts character with this cloud coming up all the time or linus the, uh, yeah pen. linus or pigpen like it's dirty and it's dark pen, and it's yeah. constantly yeah. depressed about stuff like i don't think the the films necessarily are without hope i think they all have hope it's hope against the darkness mm-hmm. even in, the, in in the movie there's that scene where they all come with candles there is hope you know so this this the knock against it is that it's dark but the darkness i think works because the characters 
naturally lean, lean into that. Yeah, I mean, this is why I'm really happy I'm not a studio head. I mean, sure, I love the piles of cash and owning a private island, but I don't want these kind of decisions on my plate because if you're talking about what's going to make the most money, Marvel's done a pretty good job of showing us that bright and fun, that kind of universe is going to make gobs of money at the box office where when you have a dark, serious tone, that movie has to be so good and so critically acclaimed for in order for it to make that amount of money back. As a fan, I absolutely love the DC and Marvel films feel so differently in tone because it gives me everything that I want. I get the fun comic book movies. I also get more like a graphic novel type vibe from the DCU. I had no problems with the tone either, Dennis. I love that it was dark, that it was dreary. It felt gritty. It felt more realistic yeah. to me for sure. It's not That wasn't my issue with the movie at all. As a matter of fact, I would have walked out complaining even more if they didn't have that serious tone with it because I want my Batman dark and brooding. I don't want him running around with Robin making quick and calling yeah. Commissioner Gordon on the red phone. And using uh, credit cards as back credit cards. <laughs> yeah, I, oh I, I, I would say shark spray should factor back in at some point. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait till we do that commentary. <laughs> uh, Natasha, what's next? Out, Adam now, wow, this is a hard last name. Now Kazowski. <laughs> Hello, guys and gals. <laughs> Love all your shows. Thanks for making my evenings awesome. I watch every day live at 6 p.m. because of the time difference. I have a technical question. I've just watched The Gift, and I'm really impressed with Joel Edgerton's performance as an actor, director, and writer. But it got me thinking. Now, how does one direct himself? Cheers, and keep up the amazing work. Uh, it's tough. It's something that not too many people do because it, it's hard. I mean, because directing itself is already hard, yeah. directing other people because you can see their performance and you can try and adjust it. You can't see your own performance, at least not live. So you have to either trust the people that are around you that are telling you, oh, maybe, you know, you should do this or that. And, and then also seeing on the playback monitor. But it's definitely a tough thing to do. Uh, Mark, you know what it takes? Confidence. Because if you're going to tell somebody like Jason Bateman, hey, I didn't really love that last take. Can we do it differently? And then you do it. And then everybody else is thinking, oh, that takes suck. But you're like, oh, that was good, right? You guys, I mean, I know I'm the director, but what do you guys think? So you do have to have somebody else that you trust that's going to be behind the camera yelling at Action, kind of taking care of the directorial duties while you are actually acting. Then you can go back and look at the dailies and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it, being a director sounds like a headache in its own right. The fact that you're also acting and starring in your own movie, that sounds just like a whole other ball of wax that I don't want to be involved in, Roca. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've directed plays and I directed myself in a play. And so it's it's like a very small microcosm of that, which you have to, you have to trust your assistant director so much and you're right you have to have confidence in the fact that you can bring the performance and then you have to have a loss of ego to deal with the criticism and the constant takes that you're going to put on yourself and trust that other people are going to give you the right feedback i think with a film you've got the monitor you've got all the, the immediate uh, playback of seeing your your performance or seeing what you need and so it's all of that gets factored in i think uh, it's a hell of a task to take on you're absolutely right mark i i can't imagine doing it on film there's already so many other things you have to balance to throw your performance in the mix you just have to have an incredible amount of energy to do that I yeah think. you know in the nba they used to be there used to have player coaches where like yeah. you'd be playing and then like when you took yourself out of the game you'd be walking the sidelines as a coach telling everybody what to do there's right. no way that would ever happen it's way too much responsibilities but i'm glad that in the world of movies we can make that happen because somebody like joel edgerton clearly deserved a shot at directing a movie because yeah. i was really impressed with what he did both in front of and behind the camera with yeah. the gift so so yeah. was i and i'm guessing all three of us here at the table want Ben Affleck to direct the solo yes. Batman. So, <laughs> yes, we do. Right? Yes, we do. <laughs> All right, guys. Now we're into live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Natasha's picked out a few. What do we got? Well, first of all, it's Calvin's birthday today, and he's going to see Batman v Superman tonight. So happy birthday. Happy birthday, Ew. buddy. I'll pop out of the cake. <laughs> but Jacob Johnson asks, should we be nervous about Snyder directing Justice League? Uh, it really depends on on it, what your take on Batman v Superman is. If you love Batman v Superman, then you shouldn't be nervous at all because you're probably going to get kind of what he did with Batman v Superman, maybe a little bit different. Uh, but if you know, maybe if you hated the film, me, I actually, I don't, I, I don't mind it. I think, I think some of the problems with Batman v Superman may have sprung up from the fact that that when Ben Affleck came on, he brought in Chris Terrio to write to kind of like adjust the script. So you may have kind of a mishmash of two scripts going on, kind of two different directions. I think with uh, Justice League, you have Chris Terrio, he's writing the entire thing himself. And, then, and I think, uh, you know, Zack Snyder will be able to handle that uh, a little bit better. 
At least he's going to be writing part one by himself. Yes. We'll still have to wait and see about part two. But like, I'm wrestling with this because as much as I feel like a lot of the flaws of Batman versus Superman do lay with Zack Snyder and how he directed the movie, I still really like him as a visionary. I like what he visually puts on screen so much that I would not hate the news that he is going to be continuing to direct the Justice League movie. I mean, look, you had a so much to accomplish in Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice. It's called Dawn of Justice and Batman versus Superman. Those are two things that we would line up in droves to see on their own when you combine them into one two and a half hour movie, not three hour R-rated movie, but one two and a half hour movie. That is so much for us to chew on and it's got to be such a huge burden to shoulder if you're the director of that film. So maybe once we get to the Justice League and we can have more of a linear story and less, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of elements of, of, of superheroes coming together and fighting what Ever that evil villain is going to be it's going to be a tough task I wouldn't hate the fact that Snyder is doing it I don't hate it right now and I think that I would have some confidence in it going forward because like I said earlier in the show I still have a lot of faith in what the DCU is doing and what Justice League could be Roka yeah. are you nervous that Snyder is uh, handling uh, Justice League uh, absolutely not I mean I loved Man of Steel and I don't think Batman versus Superman is the dumpster fire that other people think it is I enjoyed it and I enjoyed my experience, I would say, and um, and I like 300. So to me, there's more hits, and I've, I've grown to appreciate Watchmen in retrospect now as I get older and watch it now. I actually enjoy Watchmen. When I first time I watched it, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. So for me, I'm happy that Snyder's staying on. It's his vision. It's you know combined with the executives and what have you who are involved, but you have to stay in this situation it's not like Star Wars where JJ can do this because it's already a built property mm -hmm. JJ can come in kind of hone it get it going get it do that first film and then step back and let other directors step in I think Snyder has to hone this thing all the way to the, at least the first Justice League movie and then let it go from there and that, I think that's and then step back and let other directors come in and do their takes on it but he has to stay the focus since he started this whole thing with, with Man of Steel all the way to the, through the Justice League we have one vision we're not comparing things we're not being disoriented by two different visions at the same time we have one vision all the way to the end so uh, and visually some of the best parts of the movie are when Batman Superman and Wonder Woman are on screen about mm -hmm. to confront who they're confronting I don't want to give away any spoilers but that's uh, the that's spoilers where I dropped in the trailer no okay <laughs> oh that's right doomsday all right yeah you but know what's interesting <laughs> though is that it, we talked about this a few weeks ago on movie talk how there's a report that came out that said that Ben Affleck uh you know when he was playing Batman in this movie would be sitting in his in his trailer getting makeup done and he'd actually be like working on his lines that he had in the movie when you watch the movie Ben Affleck's dialogue is great and yeah. I think it's a lot better than some of the other characters had to work with if we can keep that going forward and make Justice League more of a collective unit of ideas which is what JJ was working yeah. with when he made The Force Awakens as opposed to just one guy mandating everything so Zack Snyder can work in concert with Chris Terrio and maybe even Affleck a little bit because mm -hmm. he's going to be directing the Batman hopefully I think that's going to make an even better Justice League movie yeah all right what's next okay Chris Hartwell asks Snyder potentially being the problem with Batman versus Superman what other directors would you like to take on DC films Roka, anyone? Ooh. Anyone come to mind? Well, I would love Nolan to step back in at some point. He's so that, close. He's yeah, producing. He's, he's producing. So you know, it's like Phil Jackson watching him general manage the Knicks. It don't make no <laughs> sense to me. Uh, Darren Aronofsky would be nice to see him tackle something. He originally was going to do Batman before yeah. Nolan. Yeah. It would have been even darker than Nolan's Batman. Yeah. I would have loved to see him. And I know he hasn't had a lot of good movies recently, but I think I hold out hope for uh, Charlton Copley as well to step in and maybe take over and give his shot at things and see where he can go with that. And... Um, yeah, I think those are the names that jump to my mind I, immediately. Uh, Neil, Neil Blomkamp. Oh, Neil Blom I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Neil Blomkamp. Who would actor. probably put Charlotte Copley because that guy's yeah. amazing. Yeah. See Hardcore Henry. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I If Warcraft is good, I think Duncan Jones might be someone good Ooh, for the DC sure. universe. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I, I haven't seen uh, Midnight Special yet, but you said it's really good. It's Maybe so Jeff, good. If Jeff Nichols wants to step into that, that superhero big budget universe, yeah. which he hasn't yet. Maybe him. I mean, he did work with Michael Shannon, who was Zod. So. Yeah. I like that idea. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan is a guy. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I do like M. Night Shyamalan. It was a joke. Uh, Michael Bay. I, I would say uh, not Michael Bay. Oh, I think my gosh. David Finch is a guy who I think would have a really interesting take on some of the events yeah. in the DCU. Maybe he's more suited for like a DC Vertigo type movie if you're going to mm. do Sandman, something like that. Um, and I know he's busy at the moment, but Ryan Johnson, I want to see how episode eight turns <laughs> out. But after that, I would love to see what that dude could do in the future. I also agree with Blomkamp. I think that yeah. uh, Chappie, was, I did not like Chappie at all, but I think that 
guy's got oodles of talent. Yeah. I've never said oodles of talent before, but he's got <laughs> it, and I'd like to see him try the DCU. Uh, do we have a, another question? Maybe a non, non-Batman v Superman one? Yes. <laughs> do we have oodles of questions? <laughs> We've got oodles of questions. <laughs> Tim B asks, reboot Fantastic Four on TV in the MCU. Give it a tone a la Heroes. Uh, mm. I think the problem with that is it might cost too much. Mm. I mean, doing the, the, the thing, you probably have to do that all CG, you know, Human Torch every time he you know fights he's gonna have to i i don't know I, in terms of like as a concept i wouldn't mind that you go like i don't know maybe marvel gets fantastic four back and they put it on as a netflix series we all saw how great daredevil was yeah. i'd be all for that i just don't know money wise if they could pull it off that cg point you make is great because yeah. you got two characters <laughs> that are going to be cg a lot in the move and if you hide it it's going to be obvious you know and even like how the dragons look in game of thrones is like pretty good for tv but if you're going to make me believe that that thing is made of rock and that that dude's on fire the whole time that takes a lot it takes oodles of cgi <laughs> to get that done and i'm not sure sure that you're going to be able to do that yet with a budget that you would be allotted to make Fantastic Four because unfortunately that property just has such a black eye right now that I don't know that you can get past it at the moment. It's going to take a little bit of time for the pig pen stench to leave the Fantastic yeah. Four property. Yeah, the CG points, I echo that as well. Absolutely. That's really where you stop and start with this whole franchise over this whole property is 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 uh, the stop and start because it's really important uh, the CG because it's really important to get that correct or else we're going to we're going to dip out. We're going to dip out. I mean, we allow stuff for Game of Thrones because the overall narrative, the overall characters are fantastic for us to follow. And the dragons have looked better and better yeah, every, sure. season. every season. But, but they're not in like every scene. Right, you know? right. They, they, they use them sparingly and I'm sure they're probably in the book they probably are in it more but yeah. For, for the show they're like oh let's just leave it for this one that's why like I, when you say yeah they hide the thing they'll be like oh yeah where's the thing oh he's in the bathroom in the bag <laughs> you know like at yeah. every episode and, and there's a reason Netflix is Netflix is focusing on the more realistic yeah. heroes without all the superpowers you know Iron Fist the Defenders Jessica Jones Luke Cage Daredevil they're all just you know they're all in a certain area they're all like uh, physical fighting people they're not like huge you know uh, special effects involved in that and there's because the budgets are insane for that kind of stuff every scene in Fantastic Four oh man you guys just missed the thing <laughs> it's here look at all the rubble yeah <laughs> all right what's next Jared Beatty writes what other films do you like that take real world stories for example War Dogs that put a comedic spin on it instead of a serious look Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I was really looking forward to it. It seems like I get more disappointed as um, as I see these these kind of movies recently because I was really looking forward to two George Clooney-directed movies, The Men Who Stare at Goats and Monuments Men, and both of them let me down. So I like seeing true stories like that that have a comedic spin on them. I just I haven't seen a really good one recently that I can come up with at the top of my head. Well, I mean, you know, watching that... Uh what was it War Dogs or whatever mm -hmm. that trailer mm -hmm. was like that Wolf of Wall Street? I mean, that's yeah. a sure, dark, sure. that's a dark comedy, yeah. but it is a comedy. It's funny, and you know, I, I know some people argue with me because it's it's kind of a dark comedy as well. Uh, Nightcrawler, the one with with oh, yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal, very like, very yes, dark. Yes, it's comedy. a very yeah. dark. Yeah. I mean, people are like it's a drama or a thrill. I was laughing through the movie because I was like. This is insane. Um, American Hustle had a lot of comedic notes to it. I know they wanted it to be like this great Oscar winning movie, which it wasn't, but I still yeah. really enjoyed it. And Charlie Wilson's War is another one that it's a really great performance by Tom Hanks in a movie that's got the drama and a political overtones. But again, there's a lot of comedy in there, too. <laughs> I don't know what can add to that. Black Mass had a lot of humor in it, even though it shouldn't have. And uh, <laughs> you know those kinds of films. But I also, um, damn, I just I, I lost you know those one. Those mob movies oh, do like Ed, Eddie the Eagle. Eddie the Eagle was. Oh, there you go. It was, yeah. it was a inspiring story, and it was very, very funny and and based in real I life. I wish it did better. Yeah, I wish office. it did better too. For a sports film, you would think it would, because it was really good. Yeah. And too good. Just actors. all you have to do is have Hugh Jackman do this in one scene, yeah. and that movie makes $100 million. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have another one? Yes. Jonathan Peck asks With David Coop writing Indy 5, which writer do you want to co write Indiana Jones 5 with him? My pick is Lawrence Kasdan. Hmm. Who do we want to co-write it? You know, after reading his novel, The Pride, I would say John Campia <laughs> is a guy who needs to be writing. Hi, Mr. Campia. He actually hasn't given me a copy of the book yet, so I'm still waiting on that in the mail. Uh, uh, Roka? Uh, did we say David Kep already? Uh, well, he is, he is doing writing. it. Yeah. He is writing. So who do we want That's to kind of team up about. with him to, you know, uh, collaborate? Right off the top of my head, I honestly, I don't know. Tarantino would be great. 
<laughs> I would love to see Tarantino <laughs> co-write an Indiana Jones film because it would it would make it like a lot topical, funnier. It would make fun of itself, but yet have this kind of real world darkness and strength to it underneath that, that he puts in all his films. I think it would be interesting to see him tackle an already built in property or franchise and see what he could do with it. But and then, then everyone's yeah. heads would start exploding. <laughs> well, right? that's even more reason. And then we get Robert Rodriguez involved, then we could have <laughs> no, vampires. No, what no. do we need in Indiana Jones? We need vampires. <laughs> Um, I would say I draw the line at Eli Roth. I'm, I draw the line there. <laughs> I'm gonna I, I'm, I'm gonna work backwards to the director because as much as everybody likes to make fun of the the, the nuke the fridge scene in Indiana Jones and they came to the Crystal Skull that that had an Indiana Jones vibe to it. I know it might have been a little too over the top, but that was one of the things that was in Frank Darabont's script for Indiana mm-hmm. Jones Four. So I think Frank Darabont is a guy who we can give a pass to for stuff like that. If you have him working with Spielberg and with David Cobra Cap. Mm-hmm. I don't mind that collaboration again. Unfortunately, I think that the ship has sailed on George Lucas. He's not going to be involved in that. I say unfortunate because I root for George Lucas and anything and everything, not because I think that he should be involved with it. So mm-hmm. if just Darabont and Cope are doing it, I think that could be a really tight script. Uh, for me, it would be someone that's probably, you know, just more interested in directing now, which is Christopher McQuarrie. Mm. Uh, I love Mission Impossible yep. Rogue Nation. I think he did a great job with it. He was able to take something that was kind of a big budget action film and actually make it very interesting. I was in, invested in the characters and invested in what was going on. And at the same time, he was able to put in uh, se- sequences that actually were pleasing. So hopefully, I mean, if he were to do something like that, he could make Indiana Jones more fun. Oh, I, I, I got it. I can't believe I didn't think of his name already. Okay, so who's a guy that's really good at writing dialogue for Harrison Ford? Lawrence Kasdan. Get oh, Lawrence Kasdan oh, to do it. Get, wow. is, is he we, wonder where that, we wonder where that idea came from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he does some other good things. All, All right, right, let's do one more. Okay, Joe Kempfus writes, who will eventually play you in the movie made about the high-stakes ultimate schmodown movie? The drama <laughs> has been heating up. Uh, who's going to be playing? I mean, look, it, it, I, I could say somebody else, but I think I know Topher Grace is going to be playing me. There's no, there's no way we can get Topher Grace unless we get Balatique, and, and he, if he gets out of Conjure Club, he can come play me if he can do an American yes. accent. I still like, I think I have, like, I'm like one chromosome away from being Justin Timberlake. Um, I also think that, How uh, big is that chromosome? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a sizable one. one Mr. DNA one comes meaning on. 500. <laughs> we, we need to get the Jurassic Park engineers to make me into Justin Timberlake. <laughs> and if uh, I put if I put like a toboggan hat on, I could be Eminem. So I have a lot. The real question <laughs> is who is going to be playing the outlaw known as John Roca? Oh Jesus, who could play me? I don't know. I don't think there's an actor working nowadays who matches me. I, there's only one me. Um, <laughs> I used to think Alfred Molina could play my dad. <laughs> I've been called George Lopez when I've been ball busted on YouTube many times. Uh, but I don't know who, who looks like me. I don't know that anyone looks like me out there who's currently working. I would love Ben Affleck to play me, but I don't know if he could get to the levels of lunacy that I get yeah, to. Yeah, I'd love Jamie Foxx to play me. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Dennis, who do yeah. you got? Yeah, I think Daniel Day Lewis, he's a chameleon, right? He can, he can play me, right? <laughs> I'd love to see that. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. Uh, I want to thank the people joining us at the table today. Roca, where can people find you? Uh, you can always find me on Instagram and on Twitter at the Roca Says. You can see all the shows I'm hosting, and I'm hosting here uh, the Flash Recap Show on Tuesday nights. Uh, and the Walking Dead recap show on Sunday nights, which I enjoy doing. And every time I come on Collider Movie Talk, it's always a blast. Thank you for having me. You have a Schmodown match coming up. I today. have a Schmodown match coming up on April 1st. Mance, the time has come. <laughs> you and me, son. Oh, boy. <laughs> the outlaw's coming for you. I'm going to rip you to pieces. I'm going to turn your hair back to its natural color. I'm going to drive you insane. I'm going to put you in the, what do they call the old, where do they put the old people home? Assisted living. <laughs> Assisted living. That's where I'm going to put you. Your wife's going to feed you applesauce and pudding every day when I'm done with you. Get ready, Mancy. Access Hollywood can't help you because your access has been denied. <laughs> All right, Mark Ellis. I you love follow the that? beast that we've created. <laughs> um, you guys can check out the first match, the premiere of the movie Trivia Schmodown, right here at Collider Video at 2 p.m. I am one half of the announcing team. Myself and Christian Harloff are going to be try to keep in control when John Campia and Dangerous Dan Merle enter the ring together. Campia's already here. He showed up early. Oh. He's doing jump rope in the back. He is ready <laughs> to go. Make sure you guys check that out, and you can follow me on Twitter, all the social media networks, at Mark Ellis Live. 
And Natasha, who uh, clicked maybe on the Collider meetup. Uh, where can people <laughs> find you maybe on Saturday? It's just going to be a surprise, okay? okay? <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And yeah, check us out at WonderCon. We will, if not, we'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.